Next up, right below it, is what is known as the bracketing button. We talked about exposure compensation where we take a lighter picture and a darker picture. The bracketing allows us to take a series of pictures where the camera adjusts the exposure for us automatically. So all we have to do is just hold down the button and boom, it takes three pictures. Or if we want, we can have it take five pictures. And you can set up how many pictures and what sort of increment that you want this to be at. Uh, they can be third stops, full stops, as you see here. You can make everything lighter. You can make everything darker. This is something a lot of landscape photographers will use for a variety of reasons. Number one, just to get the right exposure. This was a lot more popular back in the days of film when you didn't know what the right exposure was going to be. Not so many landscape photographers, a, maybe product photographers, do it now because you can check the back of the camera so easily. But it's very popular with HDR, or high dynamic range photographers, where they shoot a series of pictures, three, five, sometimes more on other cameras, and they take all those images and they combine one image that uses the tonal values from all of them combined into one. And it uh, creates an image that looks a little different, like, different than normal images because it's grabbing wherever the camera was best able to grab the information from, whether it was the light image or the dark image. And so it's something some photographers use on some people's cameras. This never gets used. Now, uh, what you're going to do is you're just going to simply go in here with exposure bracketing, hit the button, and then turn either the front dial or the back dial to dial in the two options, which is the increment rate, third stop, two-thirds, one stop, and how many frames. And basic options are going to be either zero frames, which means it's turned off, three frames, or five frames. And that's exposure bracketing. Now we work our way down to the bottom where we have a button and a collar around it. The collar around it is an autofocus manual focus switch. And Nikon has had an autofocus manual focus switch here since day one of the autofocus cameras. But they are in a bit of transition and they are starting to put an autofocus manual focus switch, as you might be able to see on this camera here in front of me, over on the lens. And so you have this complicated thing where you have an autofocus, manual focus on the lens and on the camera. And so what I would recommend is leaving the camera one in autofocus 100% of the time, all on all the time. If you do want to manually focus, all the current lenses will have a manual focus on the lens and you can adjust focus there. If you have older autofocus lenses, they may not have a focusing switch on the lens, then you would use this to go to manual focus down here. But I think long term in the future, we're going to see this disappear on the camera and you'll only see it on the lenses. But that's just kind of a long term process that they're changing. Next, kind of hidden and completely unlabeled, it's the most important button on the camera that has no label at all on it. And there's a lot of people who have a camera like this that, doesn't, that they, don't, they don't even know that this button exists. And so there's a button in here. And pressing the button, well, frankly, it doesn't do anything. Uh, You've got to press some other buttons with it. So let's talk about the focusing mode that it controls. So what you need to do is you need to press the button. And then you're going to rotate the back dial on the camera. And it changes the focusing mode. And here are your options. Single focus, and we saw this before when we were talking about live view. You focus on a subject, and as soon as it figures out, it stops focusing. This way you can recompose and put your subject off center if you want. The exact opposite of that is AFC. This is continuous focus where your camera constantly adjusts. And if you have your camera's motor drive turned on, which we talked about earlier, you can capture a series of pictures as a subject is moving towards you, or away from you. And these are two very different modes that you need to be very clear about which mode you're in uh, for any given situation. Now, there is a third option in here, and it is known as auto. And this is where the camera automatically switches back and forth in between the two modes. Now, when you have your camera in the full auto green, super simple mode, it's in the auto mode. And in everything else, you need to choose whether it's in single or continuous. Now, for most people with most types of photography, it's AFS, single focus. You focus on a subject, and it stops. It's there. But when you're shooting sports or action photography, you want to be in continuous focus. And my recommendation is to not use AFA. 
The problem with AFA is it is unpredictable. And sometimes it doesn't understand exactly what's going on. For instance, let's say you're shooting basketball. Are players moving or not moving? Well, they're moving a large percentage of the time, but occasionally they stop to defend somebody and they're not moving. So your camera might lock onto that focus and stop focusing when they start moving again. And so in that mode, you would be much better off in the continuous mode so it continually tracks whether the subject is stopped or not. And so I don't recommend AFA for most people, most of the time AFS. And specifically when you get into sports and action, you want to go to AFC. And so that's one of those things that you just need to be very sure about where you are and where you need to be. And so that is the focusing mode. Now the other way that you can adjust your focus is with the front dial. And this is the area that you are focusing on. And in this, we have many, many different options. We start off with the single point. These are the 51 focusing points within your viewfinder. You can choose a single point and you can move that around anywhere you want. You can choose a group of nine. This is one of my favorite for sports in action. It's a target size that's about the size of my subject. This is a very good one for sports. Another good one for sports is the dynamic 21 point area. Now, as you'll notice where it says D9 and D21 on screen, right below it, it says AFC only. You have to be in the AFC continuous mode to access these modes. You cannot be in the AFS mode, which I recommended for a lot of shooting. So these D9 and D21 are for sports shooting, you might say. The D51 mode, what happens here is that you pick one area, one focusing point as kind of the starting point, and it follows the subject around the entire area. This works out quite well for subjects that have no interfering problems. For instance, if you were to photograph a bird that's flying around in the sky and there's no trees around, wherever that bird is within those 51 points, it's going to pick up. The problem with 51 points when you're shooting a typical field sporting event is that you have other people crossing in front and as soon as they cross in front the camera might want to refocus on it and so you have to pick the right focusing pattern for the subject that you're doing. John you read the minds of a few people in our chat rooms. Yeah really. <laughs> <laughs> Casey was asking about what focus mode you would recommend for shooting fast-moving birds. Thank oh, you for answering that. Good. Um, and then to go back a little ways, just while we're still in focusing, love my uh, Weimaraners. I don't know mm. if I'm saying that kind of dog. We, I don't, I, you know the dog Weimaraners, right? Okay. Wasn't sure if I was pronouncing that correctly. I love those dogs. Uh, that's their screen name. Love my Weimarizers asked in the chat room, I purchased this camera and have problems with the autofocus. For instance, I was trying to take a pic of a bird in a tree, and the camera would not focus on the bird, only the leaves. Can I tell the camera what to focus on? And then can you give an example of how to force or override the autofocus points? I'm still confused as to how to make it focus on a bird and not the leaves. Right. So, well, there's a lot of options. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> options for focusing because there's so many different types of situations that you might have to deal with. Mm -hmm. A bird on, in a tree that's maybe obscured a little bit by branches and so forth, you would be best served by the single point focusing and get that one single point right on the beak of that bird and it should be able to focus on it. Uh, the problem that she probably had is that she probably either had 9, 21 or all 51 points on and when you have it on all 51 points it stops at the subject that is closest to the camera. And so you know, for the camera right here in front of me here in the classroom, if this camera had a 51 point focusing system from this camera, it's going to focus on this camera because that's maybe closest to it or maybe even the desk it's not going to come back and hit me. And so this is where you would use the single point focus. Now let me uh, just kind of go through these other ones here and we'll go through a couple scenarios. The camera also has a 3D mode and this is where the camera has its own little brain trying to figure out what's moving and where it is. And I haven't tested this a lot. Um, it seems like it's, you know, it's, it's the artificial intelligent program of the camera trying to figure things out. A lot of sports photographers don't like it because it's a little less predictable on what it's going to do. The final option is auto, which is just choosing all the points all the time. It's only different 
than the D51 in that the D51, you have one point as a starting area. So if you wanted to choose the far right-hand focusing point, too far right for you guys, a far right focusing point, that's where it would originally look, and then if the subject moved, it would follow it. Whereas in the auto area, it just picks whatever's in any of the spots and starts whatever's closest at you. And so sometimes, let's say if I'm shooting a field sport where you have a bunch of people on a field, there's a ball and a goal, and they're trying to do something. Okay, is that described like pretty much all sports right there? Uh, cricket, football, soccer, baseball, something like that. Uh, I would think nine-point focusing would be pretty good because you get this interfering with subjects moving around each other. And you can keep your, your target on your subject. I was out at the velodrome here recently shooting a bike race. And as the cyclists were coming down the track, I wasn't focused on a particular cyclist. I wanted whoever was in, lead, in the lead of the race to be in focus. And so in that case, I could use the auto area or the D51 area. Just whoever's in the front of the race, just focus on them and who's ever closest. And so it depends on what's most important to you, whatever's closest to you or a particular person that's in focus. And so choosing the right focusing point for the right event and your lens and where you are is very important. It can be a little challenging narrowing that down. But for general photography, I like single point because I want to be very specific about what my camera is focusing on. For instance, when I'm taking a portrait of somebody, the closest thing to me is often their nose. And I don't want to focus on the nose, I want to focus on the eyes. And so I'm going to put the focusing point on the eyes. In landscape photography, I may be choosing a specific distance that I'm focusing on. And so I'm not a big fan of the 51 point or the auto area, with the exception of the bird flying in the fairly open sky. Uh, worked pretty good at the velodrome. Um, it depends on what types of events. And so I like the single point for most stuff. I like the D9 for most sporting events, especially field events where there's interference with people coming in front of your subject matter, and occasionally going to the all auto area or the D51 area. So those are some of my favorite modes there. Now, I will mention that if you do choose the single point or the dynamic 9 or the dynamic 21, you can move where that selection is with that mouse on the back of your camera, the little multi-controller. And so in some of the modes, you can kind of move it over to the left and up and right, which is sometimes nice because you want to frame a subject other, someplace other than the center of the frame. Uh, a few question more questions from, in here. Okay. Uh, confused about AF from Ballard. Sure. Can you talk briefly about the autofocus point wrap size? What does it do? And what do the different millimeter settings mean? The wrap size? The wrap size. Point well, there wrap is something size. called wrap, but we're going to wrap a little later in this class. Okay. Uh, there's a mode that you can turn it on. And, and I'm not sure what the second part of their question was, but okay. hang on. I'll I got ask for clarification. I got, I got more autofocus stuff coming around. Awesome, awesome. And I think we have a question. Question in here. class? Go ahead, yeah. Um, yeah, I noticed um, I use the single point focus a lot. Um, but for example, if I'm all the way on the right side and I'm finding I want to move the focus point, it takes forever to get to the other side. Yeah. Is There is a way around it. Oh, okay. It's called wrapping, and oh, that's what you're we will okay. wrap later in the class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not like Thank to you. Wrap. Trust me, I will be wrapping later on. I want to see this. <laughs> Here in the hometown of Macklemore, you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is a rap video last night. He apparently caused some chaos in the city doing a rap video here in the city. So, perfect day for this, isn't it? <laughs> All right, I got more autofocus stuff. Let me, I got to dive back in and show you some more, more technical. We're going to get a little geeky here, so everybody get on your geek glasses or whatever. All right, so you got 51 focusing points, and each one of these focusing points is a little different than the other, than you might say. Some of these are horizontal line sensors, and what it is actually comprises is a couple of lenses looking for a horizontal line. Now, if there's a vertical line, it doesn't see it because it doesn't register it on both lenses. And no matter where that, lens, that line falls on this horizontal line sensor, it just doesn't work. And what happens is horizontal lines that are not in focus appear to be broken. And the camera sees this and goes, aha, these two lines are supposed to be together, so we'll turn the lens this direction and fix the problem. 
Now, sometimes on cameras, they have vertical line sensors, and all they do is look for vertical lines. And if they're broken or out of focus, they know exactly how to fix them. And so some sensors or some focusing points are vertical, some are horizontal. Next up, some focusing points are rated as an F2.8 focusing point which means you need a lens of f2.8 to make that focusing point work. Some focusing points are classified as f4, maybe an f4 vertical, which means it's only looking for vertical lines and it needs an f4 lens. You might see an f5.6 cross-type sensor, and this is a rare type of sensor that is actually looking for both horizontal and vertical lines. And so the best of the choices that we see here is the F56 cross type sensor. Cross type because it's looking for both types of lines, vertical and horizontal. And 56 means it's going to be good on my lens that goes to 56. It's going to be my good on my lens that's an F4, and it's going to be good on my lens that goes to F2.8. I know we often associate lenses, their quality with how fast their aperture is, but it's kind of the inverse when it comes to focusing points. We want focusing points. The ultimate focusing point would be a multi-cross type sensor at f99 because then it works with all lenses in all directions. All right. So having that base of information, let's look at what this camera has in focusing points. The left and right areas are all horizontal autofocus points. So they're looking for horizontal lines and they'll do it with all lenses that are f5.6 or faster. And right now, all the lenses that Nikon offers straight out of the box are f5.6 or faster. So they will work, just not work real well with vertical sensor, with vertical lines. Now the entire grouping in the middle is great because it is an f5.6 cross type AF points. So these middle ones are the best focusing points on your camera. And so for shooting sports, you can select the grouping over to the right, but just remember they're not quite as good as the ones in the middle. And so that's going to be a little bit of a balance for you as far as composition and technically getting the shot. Now, in addition to this, the one in the center is actually good down to f8. Now, Nikon doesn't make any f8 lenses, but if you were to take a lens like their 500 millimeter f4 and you were to put a doubler on it, it becomes a 1,000 millimeter f8 lens and you could still autofocus, but only with the center point on the camera. And so the center point, once again, like in every camera prior to this, the center point is the most sensitive and the most accurate in general. They're all accurate, but it's the most sensitive under different light levels with all the different lenses. And so feel free to use whatever focusing point you want, but just remember the better, more sensitive ones are towards the middle of the range. And so just in summary again, remember to activate all these changes, it's that little mystery focusing button over on the side. You'll use the front dial to choose where you focus, and you'll use the back dial to figure out how you focus. And if you do choose a smaller area, the 1, the 9, or the 21 point, you'd select whereabouts in the frame by using the multi-selector in the back of the camera. And so this might be a good time to catch up and see if there's any final Q&A on autofocus because we're just about at the end of it of this. Okay. Um, we have a specific scenario from someone in the chat rooms. They ask, I was taking photos at a motocross race and my camera was focusing on the people in the background and not on the rider directly in front of me. What did I do wrong there? Uh, you were saying that it focuses, the lens focuses on what is closest, but not in this case. Right. And so I don't know exactly because I wasn't there, but mm -hmm. my guess is that if it didn't focus on the motorcyclist closest to you, for some reason it couldn't, and so it just went to the next subject that it could focus, which happened to be in the background. And my guess is that you just needed to point the camera more accurately on the motorcycle or the, or the cyclist. Um, maybe choosing a smaller area rather than choosing the 51 points just choosing the nine so that it would only look at the nine and put, put those nine right on the engine block mm -hmm. because there's a lot of contrasty lines right on that engine block of the motorcycle. I think that would do a pretty good job because then it's, there isn't any, any focusing points at all to focus on the stands in the background. It's all on the motorcycle. 
If it can't focus, it'll just keep trying to focus on it. And so uh, there is a technique to shooting sports where you have to get very good at landing those focusing points on your subject. I was, as I said, I was at the velodrome and these cyclists are doing like upwards of 40 miles an hour. And I am trying to pan as smoothly as I can to keep my, keep my focusing points on the cyclist because I don't want to get the track behind them or the people behind them in focus. And it's a challenge because with a long telephoto lens, it's magnifying all your movements and you have to be really steady. And so this is why, one of the reasons why sports photographers use monopods is it just enables them to keep the camera more stable but still fluid in its movement so you can move back and forth. And so a monopod might help as well. I think we have a question yeah. in class. So the, the sensor itself for the autofocus is technically, in a sense, looking for like a little square on the object that you're focusing for it's looking because for of those lines, horizontal vertical. and vertical lines. Right. So if there's something that you can look at on the subject you're looking to focus for that's you know kind of fits that that scenario, that's where you're going to get that focus from, whether it's you know exactly. behind or closest to you. That's just what it's seeing. Right. For instance, if you had a track and field athlete, and this doesn't really happen, but if you had a track and field athlete that had a very plain white jersey and they have no numbers, no anything on it, that would be a very tough place to focus on. And so maybe on the face, there's lots of contrasty lines on the face. But usually athletes are wearing numbers and that helps in the focusing, where they're wearing multicolored jerseys and those sections help in focusing. Right. And does that also... Uh like, is that autofocus affected when you're too close to the subject, almost like in a macro situation um, where, mm. you know, the camera is not being able to pick up something because it is? I don't really know how to explain it. Really. Um, there are, cameras will have a problem if subjects get too close. All lenses have a minimum focusing distance. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be around three feet. Some cameras are much, or some lenses are much closer, some are further back. But in general, anything closer than three feet is going to be challenging to focus on. Right, and that can be affected when you're like zooming in. Maybe they were zooming in too yeah, far. Yeah, if the camera is way out of focus, it needs to move a lot till it narrows it in and gets it really close. Okay, um, let's get through this. Okay, over on the uh, left side, we have a vibration reduction on the lens. This is going to help you handhold the camera with low shutter speeds. I, in general, would leave this turned on most of the time you're handholding. It does use up a little bit of battery power, but not a lot. Uh, it is important to turn this off if you are on a tripod, though. I've talked a little bit about the autofocus switch. Uh, if you do want to switch to manual focus, this is where I would do it, on the lens. Leave the one in the camera in autofocus all the time. Nikon has a, a collection of lenses out. Some have an autofocus and a manual focus, and it's pretty clear as to what's going on and where the lens is. Some of the fancier lenses have an MA option, and what this means is that you can manually override the autofocus. If your camera ha if your lens simply has an A, you aren't supposed to grab the manual focus ring and start turning it. If we have the camera on this camera here in front of me, the lens on here is the 85 1.8G, and you can see it says MA on the side of it. And I can autofocus, or I can just grab the focusing ring. It's got a special clutch, and I can turn it anytime I want. So the higher-end lenses have the MA, and that's where I would flip it to manually focus. But I can autofocus if I want to there. And so it's kind of a nice back and forth on it. So that's what's going on with that part of the lens. There's a little white knob there that kind of indicates on where to line up the lens when you are mounting it on the camera. Over on the side of the camera, we have a bunch of little rubber doors where we can plug things into the camera. The first thing is a microphone input. Nikon makes an ME1 stereo microphone. And if you shoot a lot of video, you want to get good quality sound. You need to get the microphone out of the camera because the camera hears things like you holding it and zooming and focusing and everything else. And so these types of microphones often have rubber shock mounts which reduce the amount of noise. They also record just plain old better quality sound because they have better microphones in it. This sells for about $150. There's a number of other companies that make good ones. Uh, ones that I like are Rode and Sennheiser. They make some very good small mics that mount right on the hot shoe of the camera. Next up, we have our USB port where you would 
download to your computer if you want to. Uh, we also have other accessories from Nikon. We have wireless transceivers so that you can trigger this camera from a distance. Uh, you'd have to purchase a, a transmitter and a receiver in order to do it. There's also a little smartphone wireless adapter, a little tiny plug you can have, stick out of the side of your camera. You can transmit pictures from your camera to your phone that you can immediately upload, which is kind of a cool little device. Now, you are limited in how far that distance is. It's about 50 feet, and I think you are limited in the size of images. You're not going to upload raw images to this. It's going to be smaller JPEG images. Uh, but that is a cool little option that you can add to the camera. The HDMI port is if you want to play back to an HDTV. You can also uh, plug in a HDMI cord and record uncompressed movie live view footage out of here. And so if you want to record with an external video recorder, you can do that on this camera. There is a remote and GPS option in here. The GPS GP1 unit from Nikon sells for around $200 and will record your GPS coordinates. Uh, it sucks up a little bit of battery power and it's not got the strongest signal in the world, but it does work pretty well. If you want to do product photography or architectural photography or landscape photography, you want to put the camera on a tripod and when you fire the shutter, you don't want to be touching the camera because that's going to cause vibrations. The best way to handle this is with the MC-DC2 cable release. And this allows you to fire the camera from a distance with precision. It's not going to be moving the camera and it's going to be able to trigger the camera exactly when you fire it. If you want to do long time exposures, you can also lock it in the forward position and do bulb exposures where you're leaving the shutter open for a long period of time. Uh, so that's a handy little device. That one's going to sell for only about $25, so that's a pretty cheap one for most people. And then finally, you have a headphone jack. And so if you are recording video and you want to record audio and you want to monitor it as you're going along, you can plug in your standard good old headphones right into the headphone jack and listen to what that sound is like and adjust the sound uh, if need be in a manual mode that you'll see later on.